So you can see those subtle details really come across, and that's really what makes this character and these characters come alive, and for us, for the audience to, to see them as believable. So that was a big part of our process. So you saw the body motion and some facial expressions in there. This clip actually gives an even better representation of the emotion that comes across in the face from the face capture performance that then had subtle layers of animation on top to make sure that that same expression, that same performance, carried or played the same way on the character as it did on the actor. What we did is with this, it was interesting, but we knew Jim with questions on the questions on the reality of the face. Um, from achieving the facial performance, it, we, it very we used facial capture through, uh, through, through this, but we did, we, we went through again a sort of learning curve, probably 20% of the data captured on the faces early was usable, to, uh, but it informed us how to drive the rig and a lot of uh, handcrafted animation on it, particularly in the close-ups. Uh, and then that stayed true to the end in the close-ups. We really had to get in and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, literally get in and, with animators and do the facial, the, the really detailed stuff by hand. But uh, towards the back end of the show, we are probably using a good 70% of the facial capture. So it's, it, made, it, it made good inroads into not automizing the process, but uh, automating the process, uh, but, but at least taking steps forward. Um, this particular scene, uh, Zoe, the night she, she we, we, we captured this performance, she was just out of her mind good. I mean, it was just, people stood on the side of the stage and you get, when the hair stand up on, the, on your arms, you realize you're watching something brilliant. And uh, it was really nice. I walked out, uh, outside afterwards and she was standing there on a trailer having a bottle of Guinness. <laughs> she does drink Guinness, by the way. And they said, well, Jesus Christ, you didn't have set the bar high. You know, and I was like, no, we have to do this in CG. You know, and she's like, well, here's hoping. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, a couple of years later, when we finally come to, saw it come to fruition, she was, that, you know, this is in some ways the emotional crux of the movie. You know, her betrayal. I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it. But, uh, but she's betrayed, and there's, there's levels that are playing in this scene where she's hurt, then she's angry. And, it, it, you know, it, it, there's, there's, they all have to play through this one scene, and it's not easy to do. Uh, one, it's not easy that complexity from an actor's standpoint, but then to try repeating the scene. <coughs> So this is the culmination of that result. <laughs> I trusted you. With you. I trusted you. Look at that. Guys, you got nothing. You are a pig. You will never be one of the people. She tried to stop me. Run that one. <laughs> I trusted you. With you. I trusted you. Trust me, you got nothing. You're a pig. You will never be one of the people. She tried to stop her nothing. So each one of these rigs, uh, you know, there was a whole back end process with. with Defining the character, finding the CG character, finding the CG version of the actor. We had to go through kind of several remodels. Uh, we had this idea that we would that we design the character up front. And again, what we realized very quickly was it was very important to take an, the essence of the actor, regardless of what that is. With Sam, it, it's, it, it was in particular, it's his eyelids. He's, very, he's a very heavy lidded guy. So when we, um, when we tried to have performances that looked like what we considered Jake to look like, the, or Jake's avatar, and then Sam driving without the without the bags in his eyelids, you couldn't really equate it to or feel like it equated to the performance. With Zoe, uh, specifically with her mouth, uh, the, the, the structure of her lips. So we left a lot of that intact. We went back and redesigned the characters to keep, you know, the lower muzzle almost uh, a one-to-one -one reference point with the with the actress to try to get uh, the best quality we could get. From, from the performance. Uh, and it, it doesn't say that this is the only way to do it, it certainly is. Uh, as more movies come out, you, you know, you can make that decision as filmmakers to, to diverge from the design, knowing that uh, the, the further you di diverge from the actor's face, the more is, is interpreted. Uh, and it, you just have to get the white group, you know, yeah. get, get the white group back. I think that really speaks to the direct connection between the performer and the design. Because there is a codependency there. We, we could apply Zoe's performance to a completely different character, and it would read completely different. So that there's a lot of time and energy making that connection, as Richie said, down to the muscle rig and 
and just those subtle details to make sure that you read that emotion correctly. Because if you don't, then, then you've lost it and the whole point is lost. So uh, if it's an animated movie, for example, you may have a completely different goal. And they're directed to, to act more over the top, you know, than in a drama like this. And so, again, it's very subjective based on the project for Avatar. It was really about replicating those subtle details and, and massaging the, the details of the, the character to really play that up so that it was different, but at the same time, it felt the same. And, and that was really the challenge. So, do we want to take questions on this or will we move on? Yeah, I know we're going to be moving on to some more complicated scene assembly and, and, and crowds and all kinds of fun stuff. Is there anything about the basic performance capture and application process? Might be a good time now if you have questions. It almost seems to me like you're, you're filming your movie inside of a computer room where you're capturing images and creating images and, and do you, do you see that as a, what's the future for movie studio development? Almost a computer room like atmosphere where you're generating imaging. It's that's that's just it. It wasn't like that. It's not it, it, it's not a, a lab environment. We didn't do it in computers. We took it. We, that was the challenge. Which is up to this point, it would have been generated in computers with an interesting process. The, the challenge of this was to take it back out to a stage and make it an organic filmmaking process. You know, we had, will the virtual production survive and become sort of the, the future filmmaking? I think so. Uh, will, it, will, it, will it propagate very quickly? Probably not. It's expensive right now. It, but will it become cheaper? Yes. Uh, and become more available. I think that's already happening. Uh, but what will, I, I think, again, what we did uh, sort of was to take it back out of that, you know, for, for virtual effect, visual effects, uh, even CG animation, has a tendency to be sucked into a lab situation and for a director, you know, it becomes an iterative process with, a, with, a, with an animator or, a, you know, or an artist. You ask for changes, it goes back and you ask for more changes. This, it, it was a truly interactive set. Jim, what, what we didn't actually cover, we should have, is during the asset phase, or we'll talk about it uh, during the, the virtual camera phase, you can go, and he literally would say, that plant needs to move, this, you know, it, we need more light here, you know, literally we're standing up on stage and we are direct in an interactive way. Uh, we've had scouts where we're, before we ever shot any, any performances, we could, we'd have a troop come down. Uh, we, had, we had the greatest troop in the world on this movie. Just, we had four or five actors who were just amazing and they played practically every part. It was, uh, I think Kevin Dorman even played Grace at one point. Uh, but what we did was we, uh, we literally would go and scout the environment, just like you would a, 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 a live action scout. You go out to the set and check it out from, and see where, the, where the sun's setting, where, how do we place the actors, where, where does the light go. So we, we have a lot of traditional film make for a, for, a, for, a, for a director who wants that tactile kind of experience. Literally, a director from a live action set, if it's if it was set up properly, they could walk in and experience r relatively no difference. You know, they're still out there directing, you know, in, in all the same ways. I think this is designed to facilitate the process, not replace the live action process. One of the main reasons this was done, of course, is because Pandora didn't exist, and it would have been even more money to try to build this with live action, let alone the time uh, to, to build it and, and to make changes, you know, to move those trees and literally mountains, those types of things. Creatively, it, it would have been totally impractical to do so. But if you're making an indie picture where you're shooting in a back alley, go pick up a camera and shoot, you know, that's not going to change. But if you have a lot of elaborate sets or characters that you can't dress with makeup and make convincing, then this is a great tool. And it also can transcend into more stylized features as well, not just live action. So certainly help uh, design to help facilitate the process, but not replace live action. Yeah, it's not, it's not designed to replace actors or uh, animators for that matter. 